Hello everyone. Let's welcome Zach. Zach has been in the industry for more than a decade. He has been an active member of Arvar and Elixir community. He is mostly known for his YouTube videos on Kodemi.net. He lives in Thailand. His city of Dmani app. They are leveraging Elixir for enabling transactions on scale. We are excited and thankful to have him on Beam Basket. With that. Let's hand over it over to Zach. So actually, uh, today I'll be talking about um, two problems. Uh, so basically, the first problem is related to um, creating duplicated transactions. So this is a pretty big problem um, in financial systems that work with money. Um, and the second problem I'll be talking about is the problem of race conditions and how do you deal with um, basically when you have unspent amount of funds and you know you're trying to track that and make sure that um, overspending doesn't happen. So let's first understand. Um, I I'll take it one problem at a time. So the first problem is the the double transaction, right? So I'll go into detail first in terms of um, what the problem is and then how we'll go about solving it. And so, okay, let's imagine that we have an endpoint, right? That let's say, for example, someone can create um, let's say transactions. So someone might do a post request, right? And then basically it'll contain all the parameters, whatever it is that they want to send. And then let's say while they're making the call, so let's say this is the caller and this is our server. So let's say the caller is making a call and in the middle of this, there's a timeout. So now the problem for the caller is they don't know whether this transaction was a success or not because they never got the response, right? Um, so it, it doesn't necessarily only just have to be a timeout. It could be like even in the middle of a network, like when you're having a network problem, right? So let's say the, the call is made and there's a network issue. You know, how do you um, how do you, you know, ensure that the caller knows what it is, like knows that the result was a success or a failure, right? Basically it's um it's final, you know? Uh, so this is the, the first problem. Um, and before I go ahead, I want to make sure everyone understands uh, the, the context of the problem so far. Yes. All right. So this is the, the first problem. Um, and let's say problem one. The second problem right is let's say you have you know a representation of some kind of wallet and in this wallet you know there's a deposit of 1000 let's say US dollars okay um or if you want we can use bitcoin but yeah it doesn't really matter what the currency is. Uh, so let's say you had you were holding a thousand dollars in this wallet, right? So let's say wallet ID one. And let's say a transaction comes in. Okay. A transaction is created. And it's basically saying um To deduct 
the instruction is to deduct, let's say, $500 from wallet one and put it in wallet two, right? So in here, basically two things will happen is it'll uh, debit $500 from here and then credit $500 to this account. So basically in a financial system, this is essentially how money moves is you have one wallet and you have another wallet and then you move funds between each other by doing credits and debits. Um, now, the problem is, right, when you're doing the transaction, you first, the, the first operation you have to do is you have to check the balance. Right? Um, so, in this case, the first order of operation that you would have to execute is, you know, check whether there's enough balance. Right? Then the second is, you know, um, you could execute or fail the transaction, right? Based on the result of the first. Okay, we clear so far? Mm -hmm. So let's imagine, okay, um, you have 10 transactions come in. Okay. Okay. Even four is enough. I don't want to draw 10. And this one says 500, 500, 500, 500. So the correct, um, the correct, uh, result of this set of transactions should be that, you know, two should succeed. Right. And two should fail. Right, obviously, because there's only a thousand in wallet one, right? So you can only execute two of these, um, and you cannot execute the third and the fourth. So the problem is that when you're executing this instruction, the check balance, right? While the the first transaction is executing, it hasn't, you know, deducted the five hundred dollars yet. Okay, it it's not uh, it hasn't deducted the five hundred yet. So when the second transaction executes, um, it still sees one thousand dollars in the wallet. So let's say on the operation one of transaction one, check balance returns. 1000. Okay, so this is correct. On the second transaction, check balance returns 1000. You know, this is just happening because of the timing, right? Like the fact that things are happening in the system so fast that it could not deduct the value from the first transaction and therefore the second transaction is still seeing 1000. Now at the third check balance it may see 500 because the first transaction at that point has already executed right so the problem we have here so let's say the fourth transaction also sees um 500 so in this scenario obviously all four of them will go through which is incorrect right now the user has $1,000, but he or she has spent, you know, double that amount, right? Because 500, 500, 500 I mean, it's obviously the, you know, the bank the, or the financial institution is now, instead of, you know, being um, in the positive, it's now in the negative. So there's now a balance of negative 1,000. So any... Transactions that come after this obviously will fail, right? Um, but what happens in a financial transaction is, you know, things move really fast. Like, you know, like in a matter of milliseconds, you could get, you know, a thousand transactions for any given wallet, right? So this is what's called a race condition. Um, and it's, it's somewhat a difficult problem to solve. 
uh, because you want the system to scale, but at the same time, you also want it to be correct. So far, everyone understand the problem I'm trying to lay out here? Anybody have any questions? So, uh, just to uh, quickly say in case you can say about those two problems is that in, in first problem, we had a network race condition where one uh, message is sent to the duck before the another because one is timeout or just doesn't reach. Yeah. Uh, I but, yeah, right. I, I I don't think it's considered a race. The first problem is considered a race condition. It might be, I don't know, but for me, I don't consider this a race condition. I think this is more um it's this usually described as the two general problem. So basically, you know, if you if you Google two general problem, right? The the two generals. Uh -huh. Um how does how does the caller know if the other side has received the message okay. because let's say you know um if i send a message you know how do i guarantee that the other side has received a message let's say for example mm -hmm. the caller is going to do some action like let's say let's say the caller is an e-commerce store okay and you know the the caller is calling the server to like maybe it's a payment gateway right to issue a, a a transaction or whatever and you know how does a caller know uh for sure that you know this transaction was executed successfully so that i can do a pay i can give my my merchandise to the customer right just it, even a simple thing like that like without knowing what the final result is it's kind of difficult for Thank the you. caller to execute on their you know on what they need to do right okay yeah so it's generally known as a two general problem uh the two generals uh problem um in that problem it's it's a lot more you know it's described as like a war scenario where one general wants to attack a, a town or whatever but they need the help of the other general i mean you can go and read it on google i don't want to go into sure, sure, sure. into that yeah um so let's start by solving the first problem uh so for the first problem it it's generally it's not even related to otp okay um it's basically basic understanding of of um databases and and what it can how you can use the database to leverage um to have leveraged the the solution okay all right, so uh, uh, let me uh, share my screen. Okay, so uh, actually, I, I already have a code example for the second solution. So why don't I show you the second solution, the solution for the second problem? And then, and then we can go and do a code along for the first problem. Okay? Yeah. All right. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so I'll focus on the second problem first. Okay, so I'll share my, I'll change the, the screen sharing. Give me a moment. Okay. You can see my code editor, right? You guys should be able to see pretty clearly now. Okay, so, um, let's understand what we're looking at here before we go into the solution uh so over here i've kind of like created a small simulation um i just created a basically a transaction module and i'm using something called uh, nebulex so let's take a look at the dependency here um that's nebulex there and i've got the caching mechanism configured in a partitioned cache okay so what is a partitioned cache and why are we using a partitioned cache okay so let me also talk a little bit about what what we have here on this side so you can see here if i do node dot list 
you'll see that I have two instances of the same app started and they're connected with clustering, right? So I'm not using any lib, uh, lib cluster or anything like that. I just did basically booted up two nodes and manually called node.connect on them. And that's why they're connected now. So basically, um, you know, let's talk a little bit about in terms of the topology and, you know, why 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 the setup is is in this is happening in this way okay so the topology so i'm going to switch back to my um my board so basically when you have a um a deployment of some kind right so uh, i i actually i want to know from you guys as well like if this is how you do it um so essentially, you know, one of the beautiful things about OTP in Erlang and Elixir is that you get distributed computing kind of out of the box, right? Where in other programming languages, you know, you, you kind of have to set up very convoluted architectures to achieve the same result. So what I'm trying to simulate here is let's say we have a server. Okay some kind of VM and you could be running your application inside. So your app runs here. So the issue now is, let's say they're running in their isolated instances, right? They, they don't know about each other and they can't talk to each other, right? So let's say this guy has, you know, one GB memory. And state is basically isolated, like they're not shared. Okay. So in financial applications, generally there'll be a requirement where you need to have a what's called a um, redundancy, right? Which means your application has to be, there has to be more than one instance, right? If you, if basically one goes down, The other two are, you know, still accepting requests, right? So this is how your app has to operate in order to comply with um, certain regulatory requirements, right? Because, I mean, you're deal you are dealing with people's money, right? And if people can't, you know, make payments or do something with their money, then you're kind of responsible. So there are certain requirements that that make that you need to have these nodes distributed and generally they probably also have to be running in separate data centers to mitigate any risk of anything happening to one um to one particular physical node right so given that problem um you know and the problem that we have of race conditions right so generally the solution would be to use some kind of like a database Okay, and you connect to one database. So you have a shared state with the database, right? But, and in the database, you can use locks. Okay, so you can create a database, a transaction in the database, and then you can execute some tasks. Right, so some task over here. And you can use uh, you can use database locks to prevent um, you know the the race condition problem. So that's one solution, right? But the solution I'm talking about is something slightly different. So in my solution, you still need the database lock. Okay, you still need it, and I'll tell you why. But the solution that I'm presenting is a little bit more robust in the fact that let's say for example um okay so before we go to the to that part let's first understand the topology of why we need to connect the nodes together so what we what we want to do is we want to have these nodes connect to each other and have them be aware of each other now in a partition cache what happens is let's say um 
you have a cache here, you have a cache here, you have a cache here. And when they're connected, you're essentially using the same state, right? You're using a shared state across your nodes, across the network, right? So it's a what's called a distributed in-memory cache. So this is what Nebulex enables you to do, right? So the beautiful thing is, as I mentioned, we're doing all this without any further infrastructure or anything like that. It's just a library you install, right? And, you know, you get this kind of like out of the box, you know, without having to do much work. Um, so, okay, let then let's talk about locks. So in database databases, you can also use locks, right? And then, you know, you go into a transaction, the task executes, you lock. And if anything comes through, it just has to wait, right? Um, until this transaction executes. But the problem with the database is, you know, it's it's expensive. Like each connection to the database, you know, um, is a lot more expensive than just having another queuing layer on top. Um, and basically, you know, if if you think about it, right? Um, there's another problem with using the database locks, which is when you open a transaction, you should set a timeout, right? Um, so let's say you'll have a timeout of, let's say, 60 seconds. Since the lock is inside of the query and not at the transaction layer, what happens is you'll get many calls come in. And let's say this call took, you know, 40 seconds. This call has been waiting in the transaction for 40 seconds. It never got executed. So it only has 20 seconds left. So now when this call, let's say even if it succeeds in executing within 20 seconds, this call will now has been waiting 60 seconds. So the wait time cascades and continues to grow, which means eventually you'll get what, what's called a timeout, right? A transaction timeout. and you know, I mean, you could build systems that withstand that, like could survive that, like having proper retry strategies and all that stuff. But it would be more elegant if you could have another layer where the call, the caller never hits and has to wait at the caching layer, right? Because in-memory cache is a lot more cheaper than... um you know, having things go straight to the database and having them fail, right? That's kind of like the, you know, the the unique proposition of of this way of doing things. So I'm gonna, um, okay. All right. So before I go ahead, uh, is everyone uh, okay so far? with the explanation is there anything i should like any questions or anything i should re-explain or something like that all good. all good right okay cool um okay so what I'm going to do is now I'm going to walk you through the code. So now that we understand the setup, right? So I have this basic caching layer set up and it's a, it's a partition cache. And basically I just booted up the nodes. I use this command. And then on the other node, I use this command. And then I use node.connect to connect the two nodes, right? And to confirm that it's connected, I use node.list. And obviously, this node shows up. Um, I mean, in this case, you know, it's a bit of a contrived example because the nodes are actually living on the same computer. But I think it'll illustrate my point um, regardless. So let's go back to the transaction code. Um, so over here, I I've done, um, you know, uh, uh, inspect and, you know, I've logged out the transaction execution. So basically, when you see this text pop up, it means you're inside of the transaction of the cache, not the database, right? So this is the, the cache transaction. 
Um, and all it's going to do is it's basically not going to do anything. Okay, it's just going to sleep for ten seconds, um, and then basically it's going to increment the cache. So what what I'm going to show you is uh, I'm going to simulate the transaction. Let's say we pass in the wallet ID right one, and in this case uh, I'm going to execute it. So first you'll see it's going straight into the transaction and then it's going to do an increment and then it's going to output the value, right? So there you go. So it's output the value of this wallet ID, right? So now if I go to the second node, okay, and I do the same thing, and now I go back and I do the same thing on the first node, you'll see it doesn't actually go into the transaction execution. It's still, it's just waiting. And when the second, when the this one is done, then it executes. The third transaction. You see that? So let's let me show you like what would happen so what i'm going to do is i'm going to execute with wallet id one on this node and i'm going to change the wallet id to two on this node okay so you see if the wallet id is different they both will execute at the same time right but if the wallet id is the same it will wait for the previous transaction to complete before it goes on to execute the second transaction on the same wallet. So that's kind of like the most simple way, I guess, to introduce some kind of locking mechanism that's very cheap and easy to manage and you know um, can be distributed across your nodes um, in the simplest way possible. So that's kind of like the the idea behind this, the main idea behind this uh, this solution. Does anyone have any question? Can you show the cache file, banking cache? Yeah, it's just a basic configure con configuration of the Nebulex cache. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's also another config you should be aware of, um, which is here for the cache. But yeah, that's that's literally it. I mean, very minimal setup, right? And you know, it just it just works. Um, okay, so any further questions or queries so far in terms of when one small question I have is that in, in our line five, uh, we have mentioned keys as wallet ID. So yes. uh, we could have a composite like big key or a list of keys. Like Correct. That. That's right. You could have a composite key to control your lock. Okay. okay. Yeah, definitely. Okay. All right. So yeah. that's that's the second uh, problem um, solved. I mean, you know, this is a very simplified, um, contrived experience. Uh, sorry, a, a contrived example, if you will. Um, but yeah, I mean, it solves a problem. So if if there's no further question, I'll move on to showing you how to solve um, the second problem. I mean, the first problem. So what I'll do is I'll generate a schema um, called, let's say, invoice, invoices. And I'll have a reference string some kind. Okay, so I have a a basic schema here, right? Which is a string. 
So basically, l- let me explain the theory behind the solution before I actually go ahead and, and, and implement it. Okay. Um, Okay, so so the solution for the first problem is this. Um, instead of having, let's say, a post request to create, let's say, invoices. So the reason why I change from transactions to invoices is because, you know, transaction is generally a reserved word and it gets confusing, you know, when you use transactions too many times, like, are you talking about the cash transaction or are you talking about the transaction in the system or are you talking about the database transaction? So I generally try to avoid using that word for any kind of data structure that I create um, for that reason. It's, it gets really confusing sometimes. Okay, so let's say we, we have a, a po- we're going to have a post request to create some kind of invoices, right? Um, basically, um, the solution that we're going to implement is before we let the caller create this request, okay? We're going to let them call another endpoint, okay? It doesn't matter. It can be a get. Let's say invoices. Reference. And basically, all this endpoint is going to do is it's going to issue uh, some kind of UUID. Um, Do you know what a UUID is? Yes. All right. So in Ecto, there is a function um that generates a uuid for you okay we're going to use that so basically what happens is when they call this endpoint they get some kind of reference number okay and this number is generated from the server it can be anything it doesn't really matter um it just has to be a unique value okay it shouldn't be it shouldn't be like a sequence um Okay, before I go ahead, does anybody know why it shouldn't be a sequence? Uh, otherwise, I mean, if it's a sequence, I can you know, get one, two, three, four. Uh, if it's yeah, a sequence. But, w- w- yeah. So I can you know write a program that does get one, get two, get three all those UIDs in right. a sequence and I can easily, I mean, your attack surface is large. Yes, your attack surface is large and there's another problem. If same request goes on two different nodes, they can both try to increment it simultaneously. Right, right. So you're by doing sequences, you're dealing with state. So the problem with sequence is, let's say, you know, one, two, three, four, five. You have to remember what was the last state. And when you're dealing with state in a distributed system, it's kind of complex, right? Like it it becomes a bit of a problem. And then you have to track whether this number has been used or not. But with a UUID, you don't have to worry about all that. Okay? So generally what you do is you generate some kind of UUID um, and then you don't use some kind of sequence. So, and then what you do is in the creation process, okay, you pass the reference from this request into here. 
And then because the reference is a stored value, right? What's going to happen is now you can leverage the database. So you can create what's called a unique index on the database for the reference field. So basically, the database is going to guarantee you that there will be ever only one entry um, of this reference in the database for that table, right? So that's what it'll guarantee you. Now, what that means is, you know, one could say, well, um, Zach, I mean, then someone can just call you know, the reference and then call the invoices right away in sequence, right? So now it kind of really depends on the caller as well, you know, to implement good design, right? Like, okay, so is anyone here aware of the word side effect? Do you know what side effect means? Something which was not planned, an action which was not expected. Well, no. Um, okay, so let's talk about side effects. So the first request here has no side effect. It means nothing was stored. It means side effect means because something exists, another thing happened, right? So what does that mean? Like, because the in, like the, this request has a side effect, what that means is if this call is successful, something will happen. Money will be lost or something will, you know, some action will have happened because of this record existing. Right. So generally what we say is this request has side effect. This request, however, does not have side effect because all it's doing is generating some random number. Okay. It doesn't like nobody is going to, you know, no money is going to be lost. No war is going to be started because, you know, this request was called. Okay, you can call this as many times as you want. It doesn't mean anything. That's what that means. But this one has an impact when it, it's called, right? So what you're saying is, you know, by having two calls, right? By making the caller make two calls, so they make call number one, generate ID or a reference. And number two is create record using reference. So if one misunderstands this API, right, you would group this together and it would mitigate the effect of the protection because when you call number one, you get a new ID. And when you call number two, you get the creation successfully, right? Now, what what this means is the caller has to be aware that this is a mechanism to protect them against double transaction create like double uh you know side effects. So it's also the responsibility of the caller to be smart and break this into two pieces. Okay. Now, um, how do you do that? So imagine, okay, you're developing some kind of like asynchronous worker. Okay. And let's say um who here has used Oban of some like a uh, asynchronous worker system? Like a queue system. Hello? I think we're a little bit shy, but it's likely that many people do. <laughs> uh yeah, not used. You've not used Oban, Usually. right? Oban and DevTMQ. So. Yeah, yeah. So if you if you have come from the Ruby on Rails world, there's like Rescue and 
you know, a sidekick and, you know, all that stuff. And in Elixir, we have Oban. I think that's like the primary, um, the primary, you know, job processor. Yeah, job processor. So essentially, imagine, okay, the correct implementation for calling this API would be you have a, one worker, which is called generate, let's say, so you have worker one generate um, reference. And then worker two is create invoice. But the parameter for worker two contains the reference. So this will be an argument inside of worker two so there's a reference so what will happen is when you create this record in the oban jobs table it will contain the reference now what does that mean that means that when this task executes the creation of the invoice It will only ever use the same value, which means even if the first time it fails, so let's say it calls it number one attempt and fails for whatever reason, okay, timeout, blah, whatever. The second attempt, if that value has not persisted, the second attempt will be a success. But if the First attempt, it already went through. The second attempt will fail, right? So let's say you have a retry attempt of five. You know, two, three, four, five will all fail. And therefore, now you have a system which is idempotent. What that means is you will ever only guarantee, you can guarantee that there will only ever be one creation of that invoice, right? So that's kind of like the idea behind this um this solution here so far is that clear mm -hmm. yes all right so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna switch to sharing my coding screen So actually, I'm going to change this to binary ID. And that means I have to change my migrations to binary ID as well. Let me do a mix ecto create. Before I do that, let me also create the unique index. All right, so now I have the in the table created with this reference field and the unique index that's literally it um so now let's take a look at the invoice so here all i have to do is unique okay so let's go into the app let's do a uid so let's say reference equals ecto.uid.generate. So that's essentially what um, a UUID looks like in case you haven't ever used it before. Um, okay, so let's do a couple of things. Uh, right now, we should create some functions that allow us to actually create the invoice. Uh, generally, what I do is I will 
create some kind of like folder called invoice and then here i'll create a file called manager oops f do banking dot invoice dot manager f create and then here we have the params and then here we'll just do alias banking dot invoice and then here we'll just do invoice voice or chain set and that means i have to alias the repo as well okay so i think that should cover it in terms of the creation so we need um we need a function to generate our well, technically, I mean, you could just use ecto, whatever, uuid.generate. That doesn't really matter. Um, okay, so now let's um, close this and then try this out. So I'm going to do, I mean, technically, you should be writing the test first. But I mean, given that this is just a contrived example. Um, There you go. So that's the invoice created, right? So it's now actually in the database. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this value and try to create another um, invoice using the same value. And then basically you get this nice error, which you can render as a 422 unprocessable entity as a return value, right? So you just render that as a chain set error. And then, you know, the caller can actually see this message and then they can just know, oh, all right. But it seems like, you know, all is good. Like the, the record has been created, so I don't need to do it again, right? So that's that's essentially you you know how um, this problem gets solved. So that's that's pretty much it, guys. Um, in terms of you know what I have to discuss with you guys today, um, if you want like you know further examples and you know. Uh, have any more questions? I'm happy to answer them. Hi. Yeah, Robert, go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks for the, the presentation. Really cool. Uh, I really like the the cache queue approach. Uh, it's it's truly uh, more elegant. And I, I was curious, right? Um, usually, like many many companies will just run on one database. Yeah. Uh, many people don't get to ever, you know, shard their database, but uh, they often deploy several backend nodes so the cache yes. would be distributed. What's your experience on like the performance of Nebulex when, when it's distributed? Uh, is that ever a bottleneck, or compared to you know just waiting on the date on the DB lock? Did you ever measure that? yeah so actually we the problem we had was you know what i mentioned before right with the database lock um yeah we we don't shard our database we use like one database one large mm -hmm. database um the problem we have is though like you know every connection to the database is is resources which is taken right so generally we we try to be mindful and the database lock is is a query level lock which means when you go inside the yeah it's a table a table lock which means when you go inside of the transaction you know the operations inside 
can consume the time, right? So already when you're inside the transaction, you're already consuming the time. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have five transactions come in and they're waiting for the lock. What happens is the first transaction is executing, right? The second transaction may succeed or may not. But because they all share the same amount of time, um, the third, the fourth, and the fifth might might do a timeout, right? That that was what we saw in our, um, you know, in our logs, right? Mm -hmm. That certain transactions were timing out, and we were just wondering why. So then, you know, after doing a lot of auditing and and trying to find where the problem was, we we figured that why don't we just put um, a distributed cache lock on top and so far we've never really had you know we actually reduce the amount of errors uh, in our system by doing it like that and if to talk about the performance of the distributed cache i think it really depends on your network because um i think the networking layer of erlang is pretty performant uh it's pretty low latency uh i guess it would really depend on your topography like in terms of whether you're you know you're deploying your nodes really far away from each other or they're like close by you know uh i guess checking the ping between the nodes would be probably the one thing you have to do because it it does it doesn't need to check every node right and that, yes yes, yes. Okay. Yes. And no way yes. around that yeah um yeah so there's caveats to the i mean obviously no solution is ever perfect right mm -hmm. for our case it 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 solved the problem where we were we could have distributed nodes across um you know across the the different data centers and then satisfy the regulators and at the same time we can use our cache distributed cache as well so there is one problem which uh, we haven't discussed about the solution, which is network splits, right? Um, it can happen, right? It can happen. Uh, so you have to design your system to always be, you know, um, able to handle that, um, which is why we have two layers of, of locks. Yeah, um, like it, you, you don't need to be too worried about the cache because the database is always there. Yes, right? exactly. That's, exactly. That's really cool. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's the reason why we did it like that is even if it gets through, right, there is still a database lock as a safety net. I mean, th the best way to think about it, let's say you're you're in a bank, okay, and you have, let's say, 10 tellers sitting at the bank, okay, and you have 100 people coming for service. You know, you don't want the 100 people to go to the teller because the 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 operations happening at the teller is expensive, right? You only have 10 tellers. That's a pool of, you know, let's say database connections. You don't want the 100 people to go and flood, you know, um, the tellers. You kind of want them to go into a queuing system before they actually, and then they get called. You see, when they're, when the next, the teller is ready, they get called. That was actually how I got the idea was I went to the bank and then, you know, yeah, a lot of solutions in engineering come from real life. <laughs> yeah, many many startups come out of walking into a bank and hating the whole thing and <laughs> building a, a fintech out of it. Yeah, yeah. I just use that time to think <laughs> of what I can what I can do. Great. Thanks. Cool. Uh, so, uh, one yeah, question. Go ahead. One uh, question I have is that we couldn't use. We could have also used like lib cluster or something like that. Yeah. Would we like, but what are the pros and cons if we use lib cluster versus this approach? Yeah. So if, if you use lib cluster, it just means that your, you know, the, the nodes will connect themselves. So basically with lib cluster, the good thing is you just have to set up a configuration of some kind to, for the nodes to find each other. And lib cluster will handle the connection for you. You don't have to do node.connect. That's kind of the advantage of using lib cluster. I and see. I yeah. 
and it handles or reconnects like if it you know disconnects from each other it tries to reconnect and all that stuff so it does all oh, that for you i see i see so in our small example we are doing all that manually we're just doing it manually yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah go ahead arpit your hand is raised yeah uh, do you use any kind of pet pressure mechanism or like this distributed locking with the help of nebulex is the way to go pardon can you repeat uh, do you do you use any kind of uh, back pressure mechanism or uh, these distributed locks with the help of nebulex is generally sufficient um we have some kind of back pressure mechanism as well um we also use distributed caching to do that and the way we do that is quite interesting um so basically we count in a given slice of we have something called time slices right so let's say for example within you know a span of 10 minutes um how many transactions are getting passed into the system right um and if um if it exceeds a certain amount the any transactions that come with that will be enqueued for later does that make sense or should i you got it got it so you have uh, your yeah. home homegrown rate limiters something like that yeah some sort of rate limiting just to ensure that you know so we had this issue as well where you know our naive implementation you know like first version was like um you know customers were creating like you know thousands of transactions and then it was clogging up our system and we were like what's going on you know and and we had to find a way to fine tune the you know the the algorithm for making sure it's balanced you know um basically yeah so that's that's the system we came up with it's simple and it just worked mm-hmm. got it got it awesome Yep, go ahead, Sandesh. Um, do you recommend um like apart from Postgres, do you use any more DBs? No, I, I I'm pretty um hardcore lever of Postgres, I would say. Like I I've been using it for a long time and I think it does literally everything. <laughs> um I don't think it doesn't I can't think of one thing it doesn't do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and last one of our recent meetups we saw uh, Chaitanya has been using RocksDB for storing key value store. And I was just wondering. I see RocksDB Rock level DB. Yeah, I I generally try to avoid um maybe like I'm old, I don't know. Um but I try to avoid using technology because i hear about them on the blog you know um generally what i do is you know for for me like i i'm not coming from like a hardcore engineering you know background i come more from like you know solving business problems so generally for me like okay let's say i have this problem what's the easiest and quickest way for me to what's the tool that i know really well um that'll solve this problem for me that's generally how i think about architecture is um okay i understand uh yeah okay uh, another question i have is uh, uh regarding uuid yeah uh, so react app as well as backend app can generate uuid uh, i have seen examples where uuid is generated on the front end Yeah. Uh what are your thoughts on it? I mean it it's okay, but it's just that um you can generate the UUID from the from the front end as well, right? Uh so so basically in this case the client would generate the UUID, which is okay. Um uh to give an example, imagine a Trello card where you created a card from front end. Yeah. Yeah, so so basically um I would prefer not to think about it as front end back end. I would prefer to think of it as client server. So the caller and the server, right? 
you could generate that UUID on this on the client as well. It's not a problem. Um, the only thing you need to be aware of is you cannot couple the generation and the call. So that's kind of like the only thing you need to be aware of. So like, for example, sometimes like for our case, like customers don't use the UUID we generate. Um, they generate the UID themselves, like some kind of reference, and then they use that. And then we just make sure that that value is unique for them. So then you have to make sure that that value they sent as a reference is unique for their partition, I guess, for their scope, right? So, so you could do it like that too. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Chai, Chayantaya, Chayanta. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Chaitanya. Yeah, go ahead. Chaitanya, please go ahead. Chaitanya. Um, you're muted, Chaitanya. Oh, no microphone. Uh, meanwhile, Abhishek can go. Yeah, go ahead, Abhishek. So uh, I was thinking about the first problem there. The, the caller sends a message to a sender and we have a timeout and yes we try to do we try to solve this problem via using some uuid from a different endpoint like slash invoices slash references and then you know passing it over to the but uh now i'm thinking like uh, why there has to be two steps like why can't that be auto generated and in the invoices itself and well the problem is if you auto generate when you call when you're calling the invoice right and you auto generate the your code will auto generate every time which means mm -hmm. every time it'll be unique so if you call it four or five like to ten times it'll still be unique so it will never hit that that problem where it you know the value has already been taken so it won't solve the problem so you need you need uh basically the the idea is you need to separate the reference generation however you generate it whether you generate it on the client or you generate it on the server mm -hmm. it needs to be two separate calls because and it should not happen the reference generation should not happen inside the creation call Yeah, because otherwise it won't be unique. right okay. otherwise when you call that function it'll just auto generate a new one every time right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i would never know when to log in yeah so you'll never know that this is it the same one being called okay so if uh so then we so if it's the same if it's a separate request from the uh, same uuid then we uh you know then we say that you queue it something like that pardon so if if we get ever the request to create an invoice for yeah. the same uuid then we say that queue it then don't go ahead right away. right then you just stop because you know yeah. that yeah. that it's yeah. been done Right. Oh, thanks. That was cool. Yeah, Chetan, have you resolved your microphone issue? He posted in the chat. Ah, oh, sure. Ah, he's coming from from Erlang. Yeah, yeah. Elixir is has been quite a joy to work with. I would say, like you get all the advantage of Erlang, and you know, you you call you call everything from a like a beautifully laid out syntax.
uh, Zach, are we okay to continue for some more time? Uh, well, I mean, I, that's all I have to discuss. I mean, if if you guys are, if you have any further questions, you know, um, if not, I'll I'll drop off and. No. Uh, uh, so the if you are available, I have a few questions. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So current our current track is OTP uh, related. Uh, yeah. This revision sessions we are doing, and I we I really liked your talk today about Nebulex. Yeah. And uh, the how the locking mechanism you uh, demonstrated. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything you want to add about OTP and how uh, you are using OTP in financial domain? That some learnings that you want to share or any blog recommendations, uh, something for our community or what should we take away next trading, next trading things for us? I see. So. I mean, for me, like I've used, you know, I've used OTP through Elixir. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not like someone who would go and look at what OTP has to offer and then use, like, and then learn that. Uh, generally, what I do is like for the problem that I'm trying to solve, right? Um, I'll start with the problem always you know um like i'll not do engineering for the sake of doing engineering um i'll i'll start with the problem and like see like even gen server or task or you know all these things right i don't use them unless i really need to because generally like you know in frameworks and languages like elixir it kind of like already abstracts a lot of that away um you know like when you generate an elixir app the application you know is all set up with the supervisors and everything right i don't you don't have to do that from scratch so in essence i feel like the low levels of otp are kind of like unknown to me until they become valuable of, in some way to the application i'm trying to work on like so for example i'll give you some examples um i recently had to dig into the um otp crypto library um because there was some encryption work that we had to do that depended on the you know the otp standard library so that in that case then i dug into it and and had to you know convert some you know old code that we were using for encryption the api got changed in that case then i had to dig in and and do it but you know i i wouldn't look at I wouldn't um, do that otherwise. Um, and then I had to, earlier on in the development of our platform, um, I had to learn how to use Gen Server. And then I had to do, because, you know, when we do singletons, um, like, you know, having any kind of like um, operations that should be a singleton in a distributed system, you kind of need to use like a global supervisor. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever used that before. Um, that's one thing we have to use, which is, I guess, a part of OTP. So I think the general theme for my development style is like, I'll not just like target like OTP, you know, like I'll, I picked OTP knowing, I picked it, or Elixir knowing its capabilities. And then later, as a problem presents itself, I'll dig in and, and learn OTP in that way, I guess. Yeah, go go ahead, uh, Arpit. You have a uh, yeah. So it's a very general question. Like, did you consider any blockchain-based tokens or solution for payment transfer? So maybe like having them as layer one, and then on top of them, you can just build a system. For example, like Nano or XRP or something like that. Or um, it's like diminishing returns and doesn't worth it. Well let's understand what blockchain is first right the value of blockchain is for okay so let's let's talk a little bit about blockchain i'm happy to explore that blockchain solves a problem where let's say for example you know you have a centralized system right so i'm not going to talk about you know crypto okay i think they're two separate things i think crypto is 
the exploitation of the blockchain technology, but let's understand why blockchain exists in the first place. The reason why blockchain is valuable and exists is because it allows a system to guarantee certain integrities without relying on one party, right? So let's say, for example, today, all banks, financial institutions, all have a centralized da database of some kind storing the value of all the people who have an account with them. So let's say like I, I open an account with a bank, they have a database that records that I have, let's say, $1,000, right? That's, that's essentially what money is. Money is represented in, in a ledger in a database somewhere. Now, the blockchain raises the question, well, what happens if, you know, the bank goes bad or some error happens and, you know, like the money gets wiped out just because, um, you know, the, the IT systems or database wasn't well maintained and it got hacked or whatever. That's, that's the question that is raised by the blockchain technology, right? Which is a valid concern. Okay, so then what does blockchain do? Okay, blockchain takes your transaction and basically links them up. So it's basically, let's say, um, Let's say you have $1,000. Now you spend $500 after that. And then you spend another $100. Because that is linked, is a linked interaction, right? Blockchain is essentially a linked list, okay? Um, and you cannot change that ever. Like once the, the verification process has been done, you cannot change the sequence or the values of those transactions. That's what the value of, of blockchain is, right? Um, is it valuable? I've, I'd say it's very valuable. Um, however, it does come with a very high cost, right? If you have a blockchain and you're running it on your own, what's the point? Okay, if you have a blockchain with one node, there's no point, okay? The value of blockchain comes in when you have some kind of chain and other people are happy to run that node and together these distributed nodes that are run by different sovereign parties verify and come to the same consensus that yes this transaction did indeed happen and this value of um this is the value of this wallet in this um network right that that is when the value of blockchain comes in um it is essentially an alternate way of storing value right rather than using a centralized database so how do we see how do i see like you know the future at least what i feel is um i think that potentially in the future we could go into that direction where we have a, some kind of blockchain as a service where you know a centralized authority like a bank or whatever could post a transaction into a network and then it verifies their transaction, which means even if the bank database goes down or whatever, there's still another source where you know the value is stored. That's where I see the value of blockchain is. But yeah, it comes, as I mentioned, at a very high cost. Um, I mean, you're gonna have to run a node and you're gonna have to convince another party to run a node. And then, you know, the more nodes you have, the better your the va the more value your blockchain has, right? Mm -hmm. yeah go ahead sandesh uh, my next question is uh, do you use tra versioning version numbers or something uh, yeah for the transaction uh, yeah can you like explain us more H how do you mean the ver you're talking about versioning of transactions or yes it's transaction invoice the transaction for bank transactions if okay. uh, if a pay request came twice for the same thing, for the same instance, let's say there was a timeout or something and customer yeah. let's refresh. Yeah, that is the context. Ah, okay. So, so basically the first transaction failed and they want to retry, right? Something like that. Yes, something like that. Uh, I'm imagining a browser. Uh, it got it got stuck, and I, as a customer, I will 
refresh the browser and same thing is going to come back to you maybe yeah yeah so yeah in that case um it's a little bit more difficult because you would make the first call again right because the browser never persisted unless you persist it somehow right so unless you persist the reference right and and you only remove that reference from your persisted um key on the browser only after you know surely that it has been created that is how you would prevent that but yeah i mean essentially you can't really implement versioning uh for the, to solve that because anything that comes in you have to treat it as a new transaction and that's what we do as well like if you call it successfully it's a uh, for sure we guarantee you that something's going to happen like you're going to like that money is going to be spent or something you know like you're going to transfer for sure but you know um for so we treat server to server communication slightly differently from client uh like you know mobile devices or whatever uh we have mechanisms in there where you know um there's a lot that happens where you know just because you initiated a transaction there has to be a verification as well right so for those we solve it using verification of some kind where um you know let's say a customer stages a transaction they have to pay for it right it's not that it's going to automatically be deducted so you could implement some kind of a second step where the customer gets an approval request of some kind so but it it wouldn't be a versioning system that would solve that it's more like you know your system design that was solved for that okay um so do you use versioning in any other case and um, would you like to share more yeah so we use versioning for um let's say you know you know in the first when we release our application right the structure of the transaction or the invoice was a certain way and over time you know things change right we find better ways of doing things um in that case we have to label the transactions correctly because the old transactions still need to be kept and they still need to work so in those cases we use versioning of some kind to manage okay well if it's version 1 execute using this algorithm and then if it's version 2 then use the standard something like that and obviously we version control our code i guess <laughs> that's <laughs> that's about it Okay. Okay. Because I was in different context of ISO eight four eight three, where we have card to uh, switch to switch transactions, and there I have been seeing version. So yeah, it answers I, still. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyone have any? further questions i think we are good sir and uh, thanks thanks a lot to a uh, lot for your time and this awesome awesome presentation so yeah thank you for yeah, attending thank you guys thank you everyone i'll see you guys later thank you zack and thank you everyone for and thank you robert for joining us first time and uh, thank you all the our frequent participants also and uh, our next uh, meetup uh, one of the next meetup is on 10th august uh, alex kutmos is going to speak us around uh, supervisors and uh, the new partition supervisors and we might have other talks in between before that uh, uh, okay arpit do you want to add anything uh, robert was speaking something so hmm, just saying thanks to all so for organizing it's pretty cool yeah. our pit invited me and awesome yeah. um zack uh, if someone wants to reach out to you with any questions uh, after yeah. the talk and there's also my youtube channel so you can um i'll post can you uh, yeah, can you if you write on the screen in the code 
just just write a comment. He reads all the comments, right, Zach? Ah, uh, write it on. <laughs> write it on the comment in the code. I I understand. I mean, on YouTube, YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can you can ask me. Um. Can ask me anything on my videos as well. Yeah, they are awesome. Okay. I mean, we have been following that for like yeah. more than five yeah, years. Yeah, so, Arpit, yeah. Arpit did send me a few videos, and then I, you know, sat down and watched ev every single one of them. Wow! <laughs> so That's this cool. is this is about race conditions that Arpit had sent initially. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. And then I went on, and so so I mean, I I really like your idea with you know the animations. One transaction is going through, and then yeah. another one is going through, and there is second step. That really helps. I mean, yeah, like you visual. say that those are the things that normally teach.